I read recently of a pastor who was talking to one of his friends, and he said, Pastor, I, I got to talk to you about something, but frankly, I'm a little scared. It's, it's a little weird. In fact, I'm going to put up a picture here, and I want you to look at this photo and tell me if you think this is a good night or a bad night at your house, okay? I want you to look, because in this story, it's both. Something good and bad happened this night. And this guy, he was kind of a new believer, and he looked at the pastor, and he says, I got to tell you something, but it was really weird. Something happened last night. Me and Michelle, we were just sitting there on the couch. Kids had gone to bed, and you know, we were so grateful. It's been a great weekend. We're all snuggled up on the sofa. I've got my arm around my beautiful bride. We're just watching some old relaxing, you know, outdoorsy show. And I listened to her breathing change, and she just kind of dozed off. And in that moment, I looked over. You know how your wife does sometimes, and you could smell her perfume. And she was just kind of breathing nice and deep. And Here's my beautiful wife. I love her so much. The snow's falling on TV. All is right with the world. Birds are chirping outside somewhere, I'm sure. And you know, it's just, a, it's just a great romantic night. Everything is right with the world. And then he said, no sooner had he thought that than from out of nowhere, suddenly a thought, whoosh, just raced through his head. He said, all I can tell you, Pastor, was it was absolute terrifying fear. It was the weirdest thing. He said, immediately, I heard this terrifying whisper in my mind, she's going to die. She's going to die. She's going to be taken from you and it's going to be soon. She's going to die. He said, Pastor, it was the clearest thing. It was literally as if somebody had told me, your wife has terminal brain cancer. They can't do anything about it. Here's the report from the doctor. Say your goodbyes now. He said, it was that stark. In fact, I believed it with all my heart. It was such an overwhelming thought out of nowhere, so real. She's going to die. It might be tonight. It might be tomorrow, but she is going to die. And then my mind quickly went from there to an even darker place. The next thought whispered in my head was, why would a good God let her die? And then the last whisper, are you sure you even want to believe in a God like that? He said, Pastor, I got to tell you, it was shocking. It was so creepy. I'm, literally, in a matter of seconds, I go from absolutely loving life I mean, I'm hugging my wife. She's smelling good. We're on the couch. We're watching it snowfall. It was, everything was right with the world. I go from that to, I don't really even think there's a good God that I want to worship. He said, what is that? It was stunning to him how quickly, how overwhelming his thoughts had changed. He said, pastor, I didn't know what to do. Can you please tell me what was that? And he looked at him. He said, Dave, that, my friend, is spiritual warfare. That is exactly what you went through. And then his next question was even more cutting to the heart of the matter. He said, Pastor, how do you handle that? Perhaps you're in the room today, or maybe you're listening online. Maybe you're out of town, and you have the same question. Maybe you've dealt with something like this. Or if not you, you know a family member, or you know someone whose experience might be similar, or maybe it's a little different. I've heard numerous stories like this. Maybe you have too. Now, this level of warfare may not be the everyday warfare. This might be a little bit more toward the rare exception, different from what we've talked about the last two weeks, but it does happen. If you've ever dealt with this, let me offer you some encouragement today. You are not crazy, okay? You're not alone. This is not that far out. Some of you are thinking, man, I thought I was the only one. What is this? See, as believers, we face a very real unseen enemy. Scripture tells us that. What we've looked at these last couple weeks, and today we're gonna look at one of these scriptures that tells us very clearly there is an unseen enemy, make no mistake about it, who is determined to oppose everyone who stands for Christ. So as we get started, you know I have to ask, what about you? Do you stand for Christ? And if so, are you ever aware of the enemy trying to oppose your efforts? Especially when you do something bold for Christ. Can you sense it? You feel it? Some of you are nodding right now because you are in the thick of it because you are doing big things for Jesus. There is a very real spiritual battle. We saw this in part one. You may remember this verse in Ephesians 6. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. 
So we know from Scripture that spiritual warfare is real, and spiritual battles are going on all around us, and we see several instances in the Gospels where Jesus himself is rebuking evil spirits and addressing the demon. I mean, numerous times he's coming across. If you've been watching The Chosen, it's some of the most riveting stuff. I'm not saying the Scripture, but you can see kind of how one person could put meat on that and, and, and see how these these stories happen in real life. So today we're going to talk about how do you do battle in those rare occasions. And the very first truth, this is huge. What you need to know is probably the most overlooked place to start with. This is key, okay? If you're taking notes, this is the big idea for today. You need to know your authority in Christ. Count on it. Write it down. Notice whose authority we're not talking about. I'm not talking about my authority. We're not talking about the government's authority. We're not talking about the world's authority. We're talking about the authority that Christ gives to his adopted sons and daughters. And we forget that. You are a daughter and a son of the Most High. And you have to understand that authority that we have over the enemy in our daily lives. This authority allows us to tear down strongholds, to do battle, to overcome. Not each other, right? We just saw that. Not against flesh and blood, but against the unseen enemy who wants to remain unseen and that's where we start today. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 3. If you'd like to follow along, I'm going to read from the CSB to start with. I love this. It's a very, very uh, conservative, literal translation, the best place you can start. You can always work your way out from there. But if you never give God a chance to speak plainly in the most basic sense, you kind of miss a, a great opportunity for him to, to speak to you. So starting in verse 3, he says this. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're powerful through God. There it is, through God for the demolition of strongholds. Remember that word. We're coming back to that. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, from there, let's go out. Check out the message translation. Verse 3. This world is unprincipled. It's dog-eat-dog dog out there. I love his translation. The world doesn't fight fair. Whew, amen to that. But we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have, never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing and manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools, I love that, for smashing warped philosophies and tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse. Did you catch that? Did you catch all these things that are out of control with us today? Loose thoughts, emotions, impulses, giving it to every urge, right? We, we fit all that into the structure of a life shaped by ourself. Oh, oh, you're starting to say that? By a life shaped by who? By Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for the clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. I love that. There are so many verses that deal with this, so many we could explore today. We're all familiar with probably the most famous one from Psalm 23, and it says this, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> Why? See, we read that. We've heard that probably from a kid, right? Just being, you know, knee high to a grasshopper. We kind of accept it. Why would God do this? Has anybody ever thought that's kind of a strange thing? Think about that. I mean, what a strange concept. What does that even mean? At first glance, we think, who wants to eat dinner with a bunch of enemies? Can you imagine? I mean, wow, that sounds fun. <laughs> Honey, put on your fancy dress. We're going to Applebee's. And to make it better, we're going to surround yourself with a bunch of people who hate you. You ready? Let's go. We're going to have fun. See, does that not sound strange? Do you think, oh, man, I can't wait for that? But look deeper. Why would the good shepherd say this? Why would he do this for us? And what exactly are these enemies? Think about this. You've got to think outside. Dig deeper. These enemies could be a wide range of things, things that you didn't see coming. It could be a bad circumstance. It could be a diagnosis that maybe you didn't see coming. It could be a mean-spirited person who stabbed you in the back or trying to steal your job or trying to get you out of the family or, you know, coming against you, a sibling. It could be all kinds of stuff. Or maybe it's an unseen enemy. Or maybe it's something from your past. Maybe it's an old addiction that you had broken those chains and you feel it creeping back and taking over again. What is it? What are these unseen enemies that could come? See, regardless of what you think your enemy is, it is vital to know your authority if you want to have victory in spiritual warfare. A few years ago, 
Louis Giglio shared a powerful illustration, and he was showing believers, you do not have to cower before the enemy. In fact, we don't even have to tolerate him. And I love that because he uses the, 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 the setting of a, of a table. And he had this big table and he pulled up to, I should have brought some bar stools up here with the little, the high boy table thing where we come. And he says, not only does God set the table for us, but we forget the good shepherd pulls up a chair too. And he sits down and he is eating with us in the presence of the enemies. He is right there with us. And I think we forget that. That third song we sang was so perfect. There's another in the fire. He is right there standing with us. Not only does God set the table for us, but he sits and he eats with us, meaning we sit at the table with the good shepherd. But the enemy is prowling around. Check this out. He's prowling around the table. God didn't set the table for the enemy. He set the table for you in the presence of the enemy. But the enemy wants to come and sit down with you too. Our job is to say, no, <laughs> not today, Satan. You don't get a seat at my table. In fact, that was Louis Giglio's great title of his book, You Don't Get a Seat at My Table. He wrote a whole book, and the bottom line is, don't let the enemy take your authority. You have authority over him by Christ. If you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you can tell the enemy, you don't get a seat at my table. Are you doing that? Because honestly, I see a lot of whipped Christians. I've been there. There's no judgment. This is why we need each other. This is why we got to link arms. As the days grow darker, we got to come and support and say, listen, if you're standing up for Christ, you are on his list. You are enemy number one to them. Once the enemy loves it, this is the scary part, kind of sobering. If we're not careful, if we don't speak up and stand on that authority, the, glad, the, the enemy will gladly come up and very quietly take a seat at your table. He will come up. And, but he'll do this without your permission, by the way. He's not, he's not a respecter of your will. He's not a, a law-abiding good citizen shall we say. And when he comes up to your table, he is trying, he would love nothing more than to interrupt your meal with Jesus. He's not sitting there to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Okay? He's not that kind of, he's not there to sit silently and just observe, mm, well, that looks nice. What are those scones? Oh, I like scones, right? He's not talking. He's not there to encourage you. He is there to whisper to you and to tell you lies. Do you know how you can tell if Satan is lying? His lips are moving, right? Yeah, you know that. That's what he does. Look at John 8, 44. He says the devil was a murderer from the beginning. He's not holding to the truth. There's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. Your Bible may say his native tongue. I could just see like a forked tongue coming out. For he is a liar, and he is the father of lies. So let me give you a few lies to look out for. Okay, a few whispers, or if you have any variation of these, like our opening story where the guy had that thought, that dark thought just raced through his mind. You ever had that? Something just whisper right to your mind. Where did that come from? Well, it didn't come from the Holy Spirit. If it's something you question, you can guarantee it came from without. It was not from the Spirit indwelling you. So here's a few lies that I want you to look out for. If you ever hear these being whispered to your heart and to your mind, you might need to stop and make sure the enemy does not have a seat at your table. If you hear things like this, you are never going to make it. It's hopeless. Just give up. That does not come from the father of truth. That comes from your enemy. And he is constantly trying to trip you up. He is constantly wanting you to stop following Jesus. And he will do whatever he can to convince you there is no point in even continuing. Have you felt that? While the devil's trying to tell you you're not going to make it through this valley, I want to remind you, the good shepherd is already with you. He is in the valley. You are not alone. Your journey's not finished. This is what we've been talking about. Stay strong. Stay focused. Here's another lie. Hey, there's something better at that table. Ooh, take a minute and run that through your mind. There's something better over there. You ever heard the old adage, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence? If you ever hear that, that is not true. The grass over there, if it is so green that it looks beautiful and, and, and fake, it probably is. You ever heard the other adage, if it's too good to be true, it probably is, right? It's probably AstroTurf. It's probably fake, right? Like Boise State, isn't that the one with the blue foot, football field? Yeah, that's what, that ain't real, by the way. That grass don't grow that blue. It's fake. When you hear these lies, he is trying to invite you to the comparison trap. 
Husbands, wives, this happens at the water cooler. This happens at work. Not just spiritually, this happens physically. The grass on the other side, it needs to be mowed too. And if we tended our own lawns, maybe it wouldn't look so great over there. Huh? Think about this. When you get into the comparison trap, who wins? The enemy. He wants you to give up and say, you know what, there's something better at this table. When you get up from this table, you are leaving the security and the fellowship with your father to go to a table you're not supposed to be sitting at. Oh, oh can people talk like this? Yeah, this is what we're talking about. You are walking away from security and fellowship. The comparison trap is deadly. Resist that lie from the enemy. The grass is not greener on the other side of the fence. Here's another lie. Nobody really loves you. Nobody loves me. Now that is a lie. You are so loved. You are loved so deeply by your creator. If you weren't loved, then he would not have left his throne in glory to come endure a horrible death to buy you back from sin in the grave. That's how much you are loved. Think about that next time you hear that lie whisper, or this lie, everyone is against you. And I hear this so many times, so many people who are so discouraged. We can get this kind of discouragement, just turn on the news. You look at anywhere, this can come from coworkers, it can come from family members, it can come from friends. When we listen to this lie in particular, you know what this does? This makes us walk through life defensive, almost with clenched fist, like a furrowed brow, like, well, who's going to jump me today? <laughs> Wanna, who's behind the bushes? What's gonna, you know? And you start, you start believing things about people that aren't true. And if this continues long enough, you actually start projecting onto other people the rejection you think you're getting. Do you see how sick and twisted the devil is? Don't miss these lies. Now listen, you can't control who or what prowls around your table. Okay? And that's not your business. You get to control who you are inviting to the table. You also get to control who you send away from your table. You have the power in the name of Jesus to say to the devil, you do not get a seat at my table. And when you recognize the authority that we have in Christ, you get to tell the enemy it's time to take a hike. Let me show you what I mean about authority. Several years ago, when Mercy, I think was maybe one years old, Amy took this picture in my old office. Oh, I missed that office. Over here on the left, this is Mercy. How old is she here? Maybe, what do you think, 10 months? So 12 months, 14 months, something like that. I don't know. She got more hair than I have. And here she is under the desk. And here, I posted this five years ago, and somebody quickly chimed in and said, this reminds me of another famous photo. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes, yes, JFK. Check it out. Anybody remember this one? Mm-hmm. John John, right? Little John John under the desk. Look closely at this. Does little John John look scared? Does he look intimidated? Does he look afraid at all? When you look at his face, y'all, he's playing. He couldn't care less what is going on in the world. He is having a good time feeling totally safe just playing near his father. Here's the hidden gem. He has no clue the authority his dad has. None. He has no inkling about the power and the authority that his dad, all he knows is that he is safe right there. All he knows is that daddy is sitting on his big throne, this big impressive chair, and he is bigger than any enemy John John will ever face that morning under that desk. Oh, that's beautiful. Just like that, we are safe because of our father. God is so much bigger than the box we put him in. See, I think we bought the lie that, like, the world tries to have this yin and yang type philosophy. Like, here's God on this side, and here's the devil on this, as if they're equal. They're not even close. Only God is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent. Never forget that. The devil does not have that kind of power or authority. When we claim these verses, look at verse 4 again. He says, the weapons of our warfare, they're not of the flesh. They are powerful enough through God for the demolition of strongholds. I did a little digging this week for you guys, and I learned something. The word for stronghold here is okuroma. Okuroma. Say it with me. Okuroma, right? Not Oklahoma. Okuroma. It literally means it is a fortress or a type of citadel that is fortified. Can you imagine trying to scale those walls, especially with a moat around it like that? This is what he's talking about. See, ancient fortresses were these strongholds built on high mountains or strategic waterways designed, ready, to give the person inside a distinct advantage over those who would come against them. Paul knew this. See, they have these huge thick walls preventing outside enemies from scaling the walls. But guess what? 
As I learned and read more about this in Paul's time, he used the same word to describe just the opposite. He described a prison. See, he was well acquainted with prison. In most Roman prisons, they had the same thick layers of walls, but the most important prisoners were walled off and held in an inner chamber. We see that in Acts chapter 12. It is creepy when you see how he's really describing it. In this case, the stronghold was designed to keep people locked inside. Didn't matter about the outsiders. Think about Satan. Think about his stronghold designed to keep the gospel out and to keep people bound in their chains of sin. How many good people do we know are back in bondage or struggling? We've got family, there's friends that we're praying for that, God, would you please just break those chains? And oftentimes, strongholds are nothing more than satanic lies that have exalted themselves. This is what Paul's talking about specifically when he mentions going against the knowledge and the truth of God. One of my study Bibles put it this way. I love it. I'll quote it. It said, Satan uses the human imagination to create false thoughts and images in the mind that unless removed, a major stronghold can be built, preventing the light of the word from melting the darkness of the lie. Isn't that beautiful? So, from preventing the light of the word from melting the darkness of the lie. So when Paul writes, take every thought captive, he is literally using a warfare term, a prisoner term, as if you are, the, the, the image painted is if you are taking a prisoner at the tip of a spear and escorting them into a stronghold and saying, you do not get to control. I am in control, and I am putting you in your proper place. We are literally taking every thought captive and submitting it under his authority. All right, now, here's the secret that the enemy doesn't want you to know. If we can control our thoughts, then we can prevent much of the enemy's attacks. He doesn't want you to know that. If we can control our thoughts, then we can prevent so many of the enemy's attacks. And if people would just control this we could prevent so much damage. We could see through the lies of the enemy. We realize we're not battling each other. Don't miss this. This is going to set somebody free. Knowing who the enemy is and how he operates will help you recognize those lies. And then you can take every thought captive. Knowing where your authority comes from, it matters. Christian, hear me. Knowing as believers how you think matters. We have bought into the lie of defective thinking, and defective thinking is deadly. If you've studied history at all, and you've read about communist China, especially the former Mao Zedong, the communist leader over there, think about his defective thinking. He once believed that this bird right here was the greatest threat to his country. It's a sparrow. He once believed sparrows were such bad pests, he couldn't stand them. Even though they were beautiful birds, even though they did super great things for the circle of life, he hated them. It didn't matter to him that they were actually beneficial. He didn't care. All he knew is he wanted them gone. So he launched a campaign to eradicate each and every sparrow in China. But was he wrong? Turns out, sparrows were not his enemy. Sparrows are not pests. You know what he found out was a pest? <laughs> Locusts. Locusts. And now, with the main sparrow that kept the locust population in control because it is its natural predator, with all the sparrows being removed, the locusts multiplied out of control and absolutely devastated the entire agriculture of China. It's estimated that more than 30 million Chinese died of malnutrition, all because of Mao Zedong's defective thinking. That's how deadly it is. And there it is. Defective thinking always results in destructive living. Count on it. Write it down. It is impossible to think wrongly and live rightly. This is why we have to know his word. This is why we have to study it. This is why we encourage you to plug in, to be in small groups, to find friends who bring you up. Never forget the battleground is right here. This is it. This is it. This is the target, our mind. This is the battlefield. This is why it is so important to believe Romans 8, 6, when it tells us to be carnally minded is fleshly minded. It's death. To be spiritually minded, this is where you find life and peace. So you know i got to ask, do you believe this? I'm just your friendly neighborhood pastor pointing out truth, saying this is where we find peace and life. We gain wisdom and peace when Christ is the center of our heart and our mind. I love what 
the great German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. He said, every day in which I do not dive deeper into God's word is a wasted day for me. We have to know this book. We have to know the authority that comes from God's word. It's from his word that we learn foundational truths like this. Satan is already defeated. We need to know that. God's already defeated Satan, his agenda. It is null and void. He has delivered us from sin, from penalty, from power, and ultimately he will deliver us from sin's very presence. That is coming. That is the good news that we study in Revelation. This is a fact. In the interim time, though, we have to just do a little bit of guerrilla warfare, right? We know that. Another truth we know from his word, our citizenship, it's already been transferred. If you know Christ as believers, we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness now to the kingdom of light. And we have all the rights and all the privileges and all the benefits and blessings and status and authority of being a child of God. I read of one professor. He used to always say this. I love this. He says, you know something? When we're getting a lot of spiritual attack, I always took that as a really good sign. See, we must be doing something in the kingdom of darkness that is getting their attention. And he said, so I just kind of embraced it and said, okay, I'm going to take that as a little merit badge right here on my sleeve like a Boy Scout or something. He said, let's do spiritual warfare. Let's get after it. Let's go. He claimed his authority as a blood-bought, redeemed child of the living God, and he started to rebuke it. Some of you have done this. You know exactly what this is like. A couple years ago, it was a Wednesday night. I shared a story that I have never shared publicly. And I, I had to choose a Wednesday night because it needed to be adults only. And I didn't want it streamed and permanently out there for, for the whole world because it's a very personal story. But if you were here, you know the practice of rebuking the enemy is very real. It may be a very rare, rare thing in America. This is common Christianity everywhere else where they take the authority of Christ very seriously. Spiritual battles are day in and day out. And in this particular instance, I had to rebuke and pray right there, and you can too. So if you find yourself in a similar situation, the first thing I want you to reject is fear. You do not have to fear. Do not allow fear to overwhelm. I promise you, fear comes from the liar. Fear is never from God in this situation. Remember who you are in Christ. Remember your authority that you've been granted as a child of the king. You do not have to be a pastor. You do not have to be a seminary educated person. You don't have to be a small group leader. This is your right as a child of God. Do not complicate this. The devil wants you to complicate this. The battle belongs to the Lord. Your job is to stand on his victory and his authority and pray. You tell the evil. You tell that spirit. If you, if you, come across, you say, I come against you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right now, I declare I am a child of God. I am covered by his righteousness, by his shed blood. I am forgiven, and I command you now, in the name of Jesus, to leave my house, to leave my family, to leave my marriage, whatever the case may be. Just last night, we had a, we had a, the devil did not want me to preach this. Around 11 o'clock, something really strange started happening to my head. And I started to have trouble thinking and felt like I was going to instantly throw out a, a migraine that I've never had came over me. And I, Amy came in, she saw me sitting on the side of the bed, and I was just, I, I could barely even answer a question. I said, what is going on? And it got worse and worse the next hour. My son was on the other side of the bed, overheard that, and began praying for me. My wife snuck away with our two daughters to Marin's room and began to pray. Within the next hour, it was broken. And that migraine was gone. I'm standing here today feeling absolutely great. It was the weirdest thing. It was spiritual warfare. You could feel it. Something was up. Y'all, this, this is, remember who you are in Christ. We have Abba Father's attention. We have his ear. You have been granted this authority. Don't complicate this. So remember when we engage the enemy, the first thing. Understand your victorious position in Christ this is where your authority lies. It is not in yourself. Do not try to do that. If you're a lost person, you don't know Jesus, you do not want to even attempt rebuking the enemy. You can read the scriptures of what happens to people. Then you claim the promises out loud. You may want to write these down. One that I like to claim, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's a beautiful verse. 
The chapter right after is another one, 1 John 5, 5. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then Revelation 12, 11, write that down. And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Once you have done that and you have claimed God's promises, then stand in your authority in the position of Christ and you rebuke it. You command it. By the way, you do this out loud. Remember, the devil cannot read your mind. He cannot know what you are thinking. That is only for God. He can mimic it. He can counterfeit. You say it out loud so that there is no mistaking, and you address it, and you come across it, and you stand in that authority, and you tell them you will leave in Jesus' powerful name. Okay, it is very clear. You do not have to be, again, a pastor or go to seminary. This is your authority. By the way, this is normal Christianity in every other part of the world. Some of you are nodding right now because you've talked to me about this. Anytime a pastor teaches on this, inevitably we will have people come up afterwards and say, thank you. I thought I was the only one. I thought I was losing my mind. I was going crazy. I, I saw, I felt like a shadow come across my bed. You know, I'm not talking about seeing a demon behind every bush. It'd be some weird guy, woo you know. But I am talking about being sober-minded, having your eyes spiritually attuned to say, something doesn't add up here. And you see, and you ask God to pull back the veil and say, oh my goodness, my battle's not with them. It's with the one manipulating them. It's not against flesh and blood. It's against the powers of darkness. We see this. We've read this. We study it every year. We spend a week or two on spiritual warfare, and yet we seem to forget it. So convenient. Who do you think's behind that? I thought I was the only one. By the way, that's another tactic of the devil, to scare you into silence. He can isolate you. Sin thrives, by the way, in isolation and in darkness. But when we bring it out and we say, hey, listen, I need help. Would you pray with me? There's something, something that I'm dealing with. There's a great true story about this, this very thing. In fact, uh, it's a long story. But I don't, uh, I'm going to go ahead and call the instruments up before we sing our last song. And we're going we're gonna to end with this story. It is so, so awesome. If you guys were here, it might have been that Wednesday night, I shared a, a brief story about Pastor Chip Ingram over in California. And one night in Santa Cruz, he was walking on the strip called the Pacific Avenue. And on this specific road, there is a number of uh, shall we say, um, uh, adult beverage um, distributors and locations where people might imbibe a little too freely. And it's got a reputation that you really don't want to be there after. I didn't ask him why he was there after dark, but he shares this story. He's walking down Pacific Avenue, and it's getting a little rowdy, and he sees two massive, huge, burly guys wearing those super tight white T-shirts, like, like their wife's ladies' medium shirts that they always seem to wear. I never get that but their veins are popping out and they're bulging and they have clearly had a one too many. And these guys, he said, he looked at them and he said, man, if they weren't on steroids and having roid rage in the moment, they were missing a good chance because these guys looked like they worked out seven days a week, 10 hours a day. They were the, some of the biggest guys he'd ever seen. And they were coming in and they were staggering around and there was this bouncer who against anyone else would look huge, but against these guys, he was struggling to keep them in line and it was starting to get out of hand. So much so that evidently, they called the police. And it just so happened that he was walking by in that moment, and he looked, and he said, I'm human. i, I got to see what happens, right? So he said, seriously, I have my Diet Coke. I pull up against the side of the street. I just kind of lean up, and I'm going to watch what happens. Man, this looks, I'm going to pop some popcorn. This is going to be my entertainment for the night. How many cops are they going to send? What big six-foot-five, muscle-bound, jacked-up cops, five, six, how many are they going to send to wrestle these two gigantors out of this danger zone. So he sat there, and sure enough, here come the lights. And he's like, this is going to be so good. He's trying not to, you know, over, overthink this. But he's thinking, all right, here it is. First cop car pulls up. Door opens up, and he says, oh, wow. He couldn't believe what he saw. Stepping out of the cop car was one single, no backup, four foot 11 police lady. Oh, this is so awesome. This is so good. And he said, I'm just being honest. I thought to myself, oh, no. Where are the other four or five guys who are going to come and back up this poor lady who has got her hands way full with these two massive drunk giants? And he watched, and he said he loved her confidence. She was so confident. Four foot 11. She walks up to these two guys and says, gentlemen, do we have a problem here? I would love to have been there for that. Do we have a problem here? They dismissed her 
with almost like they were swatting a gnat and says, no, we're good. You can leave. I love it. She says, what's that? Excuse me? Four foot 11. She goes up, she steps forward, and she eyeballs them both. And she says, um, just so you know, I am authorized by Santa Cruz County to enforce the law. Do you understand that? These two guys turned on her, took a step toward her. And she says, clearly you do not understand. So she held up her badge and she said, I have the authority right here and right now. Since you do not understand what's happening, let me spell it out for you. She put her hand on her sidearm and she said, let me explain what's about to happen. You must do what I say. I am authorized by Santa Cruz County to enforce the law, and I'm going to do that. Now, both of you, over here against the car, and out came the handcuffs. Pastor Chip said this was the most amazing next 30 seconds. These two big guys, strong, drunk, out of control, had never been sober so fast. They looked at each other with fear in their eyes as if, this lady's serious. We, better, we can't go back to jail. She said, within seconds, this four foot 11 woman absolutely manhandles these two giants, spreads them out on the hood, puts their hands behind the back, whips out the cuffs, boom, 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 and the crowd is going nuts. They're cheering her on, and she is an absolute hero. Here's what Pastor Chip said. He said, when I looked at her, I could not have been more wrong. I totally judged a book by its cover. And then it hit him. You know why he was wrong? Because the issue is not your size. The issue is not even your strength. The issue is your authority. Never forget that. This is where your power comes from. Think about this confident policewoman. See, she had a badge. So do you. She, she knew that she had her position of authority. She says, I have all the rights invested in me to exercise that. You have to do what I say. Y'all, you are a child of the king. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, your badge is your position in Christ. And your sidearm, by the way, is your sword. It's right here. Demons must believe this. They must obey it. They must respond to the authority of every child of God. When you take the word of God and you claim your rightful authority, you are unstoppable. Sometimes it may be something that you can handle by yourself like that. Sometimes it takes two or three others to be there. That night that I dealt with a demonic entity, the one I shared on Wednesday night, took two other ministerial students, took over an hour. It was the most frightening thing I'd ever been through. And this, I'm not talking about it. this happens all the time. It's happened twice in 30 years of ministry, twice. That's it. That's how rare this is. But once we knew what we were dealing with and it wasn't hard to find out, we claimed our authority and that's when it broke. It was like night and day. One day, maybe on a Wednesday night, I'll, I'll, I'll reshare this. Here is the truth that you need to take. This is your challenge this week. I need you to remember not only who you are, but whose you are. You catch that? Remember, not only who you are, but whose you are. Never forget that. Claim that. Stand on that authority. Act on what you know is true. Let me pray for us. Would you bow with me? Lord, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the authority you've given us. Thank you for being so real. We know the battle wages on, Lord. We can feel it so many times when we're in tune with you. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open our eyes, that you would let the scales fall, that we would see the manipulator, that we, would just, we wouldn't be afraid, we wouldn't cower, we would just claim the authority you've given us and put him in check until you come and you make all things right. God, I know there's people today, maybe they're traveling, maybe they're listening at home or online, maybe in this room, I know there are people today that are ready to tear down a stronghold. God, would you give us the authority to claim your promises? We come against the enemy, not in our own flesh, but according to your word, according to the power you've given us as your children. And we stand on that. Thank you for that privilege. In Jesus' name, amen.